Good evening, and it's again my privilege to welcome you to this little session again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it is my prayer that the blessings of the Lord may be well known to you all, that is, that you be sensitive to them, that you be conscious of the fact that we, if you know the Lord today, you are blessed. You are blessed with his favor. You are blessed with his promise. You're blessed with his assurances. You have all of those things, but we are to cultivate that. Uh, walk as in the presence of God. The, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. In the Old Testament, the commandment to Abraham was, walk thou before me and be thou perfect. And literally, we are to be and then in the pursuit of holiness. We are to be conscious of his power and his presence. We are to recognize that we are the product of redemption. And to be having been redeemed, we know that there was nothing that we could do to help ourselves. But it is by his mercy that we are brought out. It is by his grace that we have all provision it is by the hope that is placed within us through the indwelling of Christ Jesus our Lord that we enjoy the hope of eternal life and thus rejoice in not only that which we have now in the way of joy in the Holy Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. This we should be able to experience no matter the circumstances about us. It, all we have to do is turn on the television or listen to any news broadcast, and you will hear of difficulties, of trials, of troubles, of wickedness in high places, of immorality, of all these things that are characteristic of fallen man. And it is amazing as we look about us and behold the wonders of God's creation we watch the uh, members of the animal kingdom and see how well they operate. The whole system is harmonious. And yeah, we see things that appear to be violent and all like that, but it reflects the order of the Creator. And only it has been well said that only man fouls his own nest. And this is exactly through the pursuit of immorality and all of these things, this is exactly what has taken place. And it's, it's scary to me that I see often these things being carried on, even in the name of Christianity. It can't be because we see no evidence of Christ in what is going on. And so I want to address a little bit uh, the thoughts today, and I'm going to be turning to the first chapter of the book of Titus, and there I hope to be able to share with you some thoughts about putting ourselves in a proper perspective and our proper approach unto God and our conditions whereby we are able to call ourselves the children of God. Let's look to him just now. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for every overture of your kindness and mercy towards us. Thank you, O Father, for the great love wherewith thou hast loved us, for the wondrous gift of thy Son, Christ Jesus our Lord, to suffer and die in our stead. And we rejoice that he has risen again, has ascended on high, is seated at the right hand of power, is ruling and reigning, expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. And we rejoice in the surety of his coming again. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And thus, as we would endeavor to seek his blessings upon us, and I do pray for each one of you, especially of my churches, and ask that God would visit you, would cause your perspective to be guided by what you know to be true of him. So I pray that we be led just now to bring honor and glory unto his name. I ask it through Christ Jesus, my Lord, and amen. We spent some time in the latter part 
of Second Timothy. Uh, actually, we began our thoughts back in the third chapter of Second Timothy. And as far as the order of books are concerned, it would seem that the epistle to Titus perhaps would fit in between these the two epistles rather than it being the third one of those that are characterized as pastoral epistles or that were written with a view to being of an assistance to pastors. And these men were pastors, that is, Timothy and Titus. And Paul had taken them in when they were younger. They had traveled with him extensively. They were by this time well-versed in the matters of the gospel, in the order of things as Paul had ordained them. And even here, he makes the declaration um, that he said, I left, I left you in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And so this setting forth, as it were, um, these instructions, he, he trusted the Lord, first of all, but also he was confident that Titus understood the mission and would faithfully carry it out. But I don't want to go into so much the commission to Titus just now as I want to visit Paul's introductory remarks to Titus in this epistle. So I'm going to read in your hearing the first four verses, and then we will comment at greater length on some and lesser length on others. But we begin, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the foundation of the world, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. And may God bless the reading of his word. That was all one sentence. And as we who are read the Bible quite a bit are familiar with the very lengthy sentences, especially of the Apostle Paul. Now, the, the King James translators have done a marvelous job of properly punctuating and even though the originals were not, but nevertheless, we're able to see how the Apostle Paul transitions from one thought to another. Here, he would, in that first verse, identify himself, his role, his relationship to God, and that which he would, of course, commend to all. And then uh, the, the fact is that this being in accordance with the faith of God's elect, that we would understand the hope of eternal life, and then to see something of this mystery whereby things that are uh, uh, hidden, if you will, in eternity past are made manifest through the preaching of the gospel. And so there's several things here that we want to deal with. And to begin with, Paul's identity himself as to who he is. Quite often we ask, someone is asked, well, what, um, what do you do? Or uh, how do you identify yourself? And if someone would ask me, how do I identify myself? And I would say without hesitation, my name is Brant Sechrist born again of the Spirit of God, called to preach the gospel. I am a preacher of the gospel. And Paul would say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And that is not a matter of brag. It is not a matter of self-promotion. Uh, it is rather a matter of identification. That's who I am. Now, what you may not be quite ready for is to see the very demeaning way that the Apostle Paul identifies himself in this passage of Scripture. Because when he says that uh, 
Paul, a servant of God. And I'm just going to stop right there because the word servant here in this case, and we're often to think of a servant, um, there are people who hire themselves out to others as their servants. Um, there are maids, there are valets, uh, people along this line. There's another word in the scripture for minister. It's the same word that we get the word deacon from, but quite often it is used in, as in the idea of sometimes servant, but quite often as minister. But when Paul here says that I am Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, he is using the Greek word doulos. And that word doulos means um, a bond slave, one who is owned by another. Now, I realize in this age of political correctness, any idea of one person being in servitude to another is hated by many. And yet, I'm going to set forth something here in a little bit, and I am sure that if many listen to it, they would be quite offended by it. But I'll put it in the context that the Bible does, and we'll leave it at that. But not, not, and I'm not going to, I don't defend slavery. Uh, it's, it's a horrible thing that took place. It's a black mark on our nation. And any time a man enslaves man, that is a bad thing. And so, but nevertheless, we, we know that it's there. It's part of the history. And it, it is prayerfully not something that is a characteristic of today. Although we know it's going on in places throughout this world. And while there is much focus on the issues in this country, quite often the same people who are decrying things in this land are ignoring the fact that in some of the places that they actually defend, it's going on unabashed. And so nevertheless, that's another message for another time. But Paul, the fact is here, calls himself the doulos, a servant of God. And that word, and it is the most abject, servile term for a slave among the Greeks. In other words, that there was that was the deepest and the darkest form of slavery. And nevertheless, it becomes the expression of true humility to Christians. And the Paul said it plain and simple in writing to the Corinthians, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. And I don't hesitate to make that statement that I am not my own. I am the slave of Jesus Christ. I am the slave of God. I have been purchased. I have been bought. And nevertheless, I delight to tell you that because the alternative is to be a slave of something else. When the Lord said this, he said, you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. Understand that the implication there was you're going to serve one or the other. You're going to be either the slave of God or you're going to be the slave of worldliness or of sin or of the material things of this present world. And so when Paul used that term, uh, he used it so, and he did it intentionally. He didn't hesitate. He wasn't ashamed of it. He called it out in many places. And he saw that love, strong bond had him completely owned and he did not resent it. He rejoiced in it. And so do all true believers. If you're still holding on to some ownership of yourself, well, I have rights or I can do this. Uh, it's that, that's this part of it I reserve for myself. And I think many compartmentalize their idea of the faith. You know, this is church is part of it and, and uh, maybe praying a little bit's part of it and all like that, they do not realize that 24-7, they are the property, if indeed they're born again of the Spirit of God, and I'll say more about that in just a moment, that they are truly the slaves of Jesus Christ. And so I know, again, I am sure that <clears throat> there may be some hearing this, 
that, oh, I don't like that terminology. I don't like to use it that way. Well, I'm sorry. The Scripture does. And, I mean, I'm sorry for you. I'm not sorry for saying it. And I'm not sorry that the Scripture does it. I rejoice that the Scripture reveals such a strong bond in the relationship that I have with God, my Savior, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to understand this. There are some things that, that here again, as I said, it becomes the expression of true, true humility as far as Christians are concerned. It refers, this one specifically, this word refers to one born into slavery. This we recognize that we could go, just go back as far as what went on in the Old South. Sl uh, slaves were bought. Uh, if they had children, their children become the properties of their masters. And so there were quite a number of slaves in the Old South that were literally born into slavery. And you see, oh, yeah, what, what a horrible situation. And I've already made myself clear on that. It is a horrible situation. But there was another word used by the Greeks for those that were taken into slavery as a result of war. Quite often nations were conquered and then people were taken into slavery as a result of that conquest. And so there's a little different picture as far as that is concerned. But there were those, in this case, it refers to ones who were actually born in slavery. It refers to one... Um, who, whose will is swallowed up in the will of another. In other words, the slave has no rights. He has nothing that he can claim. No, this is, this is my part. This is what I can do. His, his will was completely swallowed up in the will of his master. He only moved within the confines of what was permitted by his master or what was commanded by his master. He said, boy, this, this is not really sounding good at all. And so what though we come to understand and where we can put this into a very positive situation is that Paul was, and he called himself that, he was the bond slave of sin in um, the third chapter of this book of um, Titus. If we read these words. Um, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, and listen to this terminology, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's how you serve sin. That's how you serve your own will. That's how you serve your own way. And so, those David called himself as one born in sin and shapen in iniquity. So there again, bond slave either of sin or the bond slave of Christ. And so this thought, again, after salvation, Paul was, he saw himself in that way. After salvation, his will was swallowed up in the sweet will of God. What a precious thought this is. And by the way, I derived some of these definitions from reading Kenneth Wiest, who was a prominent Greek scholar. But there again, swallowed up in the sweet will of God. But understand this, that when he was born again, born anew, he was born into that doulos or born into that slavery to God but it's the bonding is love. It's not hatefulness. It's not that idea of condemnation. And here again, there is such a delusion as far as man is concerned. I believe in the free will of man, I often hear. I can do what I want to. Nobody is going to tell me what to do. Do you hear what you are saying when you make those statements? You are saying that you are the servant of a sinful nature. You are servant of the devil. You're doing exactly what he wants you to do. And your will is actually swallowed up in the will of another. 
What the man likes to just think it's oh it's up to me I can make my own decisions. If I decide to be a Christian, then I'll be a Christian. No, you won't. That's not how it works. And besides that, unless God moves in, borns you again, and deals with you in the way that only He through the Holy Spirit can, then you will remain in bondage throughout all of your days to the will of Satan. No, no, he's not telling me what to do. Yes, he is. Even your pride right now, as you resent such statements as that, are declaring that that's exactly who you are. Isn't it wonderful? And I say this to those who love the Lord. Isn't it wonderful to just simply be sweetly submitted unto the will of God, unto the direction of the Holy Spirit, just buried in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, able to rejoice in the fact that I'm not my own. I was, I thought I was my own for a long time, and all I did was make a mess of things. Everything, everything was sin. Whatsoever is not of faith, it is sin. And, and thus, I, at, at best, I could manage a little bit of religious thought, but then it would get swallowed up in pride and soon be buried. And so this is what, uh, and doulos, it just re- re- refers to one a serves, who serves another, and he does so to the disregard of his own interests. And this is where I find something disturbing as far as Christians are concerned. They will often, professing Christians will often, prefer their own interest or the interest of the things of this world to the things of God. Now, I can't believe that they're truly happy while they're doing that, but there's that remnant of the old nature. There's that compulsion that says, no, no, I, that's okay. I can, I can own this. I want to have that. I want to be entertained by this. I want to follow. And, well, I'm sorry, that's going to conflict with church. Well, I'm I'll just miss one time, or I'll just miss a couple of times, and that'll be all there is to it. But I'm sorry. It just simply, when one truly understands his relationship to God, the interests of God are to the disregard of his own interest. Before he was saved, Satan, and here again, before he was saved, he was serving Satan, disregarding his own best interests. Now, I make that. When we're saved, we disregard our own old nature interest. Now, when we're saved, but before we were saved, we disregarded our best interest and rather just went along with whatever Satan had to had for us. We walked according to the prince of this world, Ephesians chapter 2. And so, the fact is, that Paul, thus seeing this situation, says that it's according to the faith of God's elect. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, special ambassador, called out with this purpose in mind, and that in correspondence to the faith of God's elect. This is not the ability to believe or even the exercise that we undergo in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ It is the body of truth believed by God's people. And so Paul's urgings, Paul's reminders here, Paul's being quite consistent with everything that is set forth from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. It's that whole body of truth. And this is that which is to the acknowledging of the truth. And so it's truth that's after godliness. What is godliness? It's godlikeness. It is living as in the presence of God. It is living with a consciousness of belonging to God. It is living with that desire to honor God above all else. And so when we see that, and here again, uh, that again, let me read that whole verse. Paul, a servant, doulos of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, ambassador, sent forth with a task, 
according to the faith or in correspondence with the faith delivered once and for all unto the saints. See Jude. And then we would understand the acknowledging of the truth. That is confirming that what he said, it is true. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This was the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is after godliness, in the pursuit of holiness. That is, doing those things which is pleasing unto God. And so, this again done, in hope of eternal life. And, and you know, I hear some people say, well, I hope I make heaven. Well, I, you want to go to heaven? Yeah, I, I want to go to heaven. Doesn't everybody? And, of course, there's a lot of people who want to go to heaven, but they don't want to depart from this present world. They love this present world. And the fact is, though, that this hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Again, this thought of promised, purposed, this was what he determined for us, for we who love him, who love his appearing. And we need to truly look to that. And so then he just says something that I think is just quite wonderful. He hath in due times manifested the word through preaching. And then Paul goes on to add, which is committed unto me. He wasn't the only one. He wasn't saying, I've got the handle on it all. But it was committed unto me to not only to preach the gospel, and as you'll see that he says to, to uh, Titus and to Timothy as well, to look for men to commit the gospel under their trust. And this was something that was to be promoted. Why preachers? Why is it important to go hear the preaching of the word? This is the method that God ordained. Some would say, well, I can read the word of God, but... Through the foolishness of preaching, it pleased God to save them that believe. That doesn't put the power of salvation in my hand or in the hand of any other preacher. What it does say that in the preaching of the word, in other words, the emphasizing, the exhorting, the exclamation point placed on the word of God, the, the intensity with which the word of God is to be understand, understood, it is promoted, it is exemplified in the preaching of the Word. I'm excited about what I'm telling you right now. And I realize you can read these words as easy as I can, but I want to put emphasis on them, and I want the emphasis to resound with you. And so, in due times, manifested through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior." I'm doing what he has told me to do. Doesn't it seem strange that God would command men like Paul and poor little preachers like me uh, that to preach the Word of God, that it would be emphasized throughout the Word of God, and then leave it to you just whether or not you feel like it's important to go give attendance to it or not. Uh, I'll do my own little religious thing. I'll do it my way. And there is no way but God's way. And these things he has ordained. Oh, that God would grant an outpouring of his spirit upon us that we might be thrilled, might be delighted, might love the opportunities that we have to attend on the preaching of the word of God and to be preachers of the word of God ourselves. It's not for you just simply to hide your light unto a bushel, your lights of the world. And thus we are to act as such. You are what you need to be. I've said it before. I'll say it again. And so thus he addresses to Titus, mine own son after the common faith and desires for him grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Paul doesn't hesitate to go back to that divine order of things. God who has decreed salvation, Jesus Christ who has suffered and died on Calvary's cross to procure, procure salvation, and God the Holy Spirit who brings these words to life and illuminates these things and quickens those whom God has set forth before him. 
Oh, that we might indeed respond with great delight to being called the bond slave of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you now, is my prayer.